Hello everyone, I hope you're having a wonderful day and welcome to another episode of Motorsport History. First we went through the cars, then the motorcycles, and this time the elephant in the room, or should I say, the desert. This is the type of vehicle that you don't see in many motorsport divisions, that is probably because of its size. I'm talking about the trucks of course. That makes part 3 of my Dakar series, if you haven't seen the others, I'll put a link in the top right. Before we get into it, if you like my content, be sure to like and subscribe, I'd appreciate the support. Just like with the cars, the first vehicles were mostly meant for the military. They had to be tall trucks with all kinds of terrain technologies in order to be able to plow through the sand like they did. If these things get stuck, there's no one that can save you. With big engines and enormous tires racing side to side with cars, a sight to behold. Now imagine being in one of those cars, or even worse, the motorcycles looking back and seeing a mountain roaring behind you. The first Dakar truck race was hosted just like the others. In 1979, in first place we had Pinsgawa, an Austrian company working under Puch. The vehicles came with a 4x4 or a 6x6 layout. The earlier models came with an air-cooled 2.5 liter gasoline engine, although the 712 variants, the 6x6, managed to obtain an air-cooled 2.7 liter gasoline engine towards the end of its production making 90 horsepower and 133 pound-feet of torque through a 5-speed manual gearbox. Sadly, we didn't see much of this truck, only claiming first place in 1979 and never seen on the podiums again. For the years of 1979 and 1980, we saw two manufacturers claim podiums, but just like Pinsgawa, they were never seen again. Those two companies were Unic, a French company that through time merged with others to form Iveco, and the other was Sonacom, an Algerian brand of trucks. Sadly, there isn't much information on which trucks they raced and their specifications, so I'm gonna have to skip them. So up next, in 1981, the first place was claimed by ACMAT. This is what it stands for. But instead of me trying to butcher what this reads out, I'm gonna tell you that it translates to Atlantic Mechanical Engineering Workshops. Just like the Pinsgawa, these were military terrain vehicles coming in a 4x4, 6x6 and an extra 8x8 layout, although those were only used to carry troops. Sadly, I do not know what they raced with that year's, but here's what it seems to be the same truck, just newer, just as an idea. Their TMC 420BL6 was powered by a 4-cylinder Cummins turbo diesel, which I believe was a 4.5 liter, making just short of 170 horsepower. This company was later sold as a subpart of Renault. In 1981, behind Akmat, we had a Ford. Sadly, I couldn't find much about their truck. But in third was a competitor that was sneaking up the podiums, soon to be one of the best. That was Mercedes-Benz. They pretty much raced with the Unimog. The regular Unimogs are nowadays mostly seen plowing snow and such, but the race version is much more interesting. It came with a 6.5 liter 6 cylinder turbo diesel making 180 horsepower and that made around 350 pound feet of torque. As you can see, this truck had a lot of potential, and it used it right. After its third place in 81, it was first and second in 82, first in 83, first and second again in 84, first and third in 85, and finally first again in 86. I do have to mention Mercedes-Benz was seen in third place as well in 93. Quite an impressive stance if you ask me. In the shadows of the Mercedes, we saw a brief glimpse of another cool truck, the Volvo C303 another military-based vehicle which was able to keep up with the Mercedes in the year of 83. The Volvo was actually powered by an engine seen in one of their sedans, more specifically the Volvo 164. Odd, but that was probably because of its small size. It came with a 3-liter gasoline-fueled straight 6. That made 125 horsepower and 165 pound-feet of torque. That was connected to only a 4-speed gearbox powering the 4x4 drivetrain, but luckily it did come with a high-low transfer case but so did all the others. It's safe to say that what probably got this thing on the podiums was its agility. It was lighter than the other trucks. So comparing this to the Mercedes, it doesn't steal the highlight, but it is pretty cool. The competitor that did manage to steal the show from Mercedes was actually the truck company, DAF. They were also lurking in the shadows ever since 1982. Now this is where the history gets very interesting. So that year, in 1982, Jan de Roy, a wealthy Dutch businessman, wanted to give it a shot. He initially raced with an ordinary 200 horsepower DAF truck, 
and since that didn't get him the results he wanted, he decided to spice things up a little bit. His experiments were named Jan's missiles. He took two daft trucks and combined them to face in separate directions, so that means it had two cabins facing the opposite ways and two engines sitting on their own axles. This truck managed to make around 800 horsepower, but it was pretty much recognized only as a sort of a concept. Something to raise everyone's eyebrows. And Jan wasn't done. He didn't ditch the idea. He just made it better. He made a truck, the DAF F3300, also called the Turbo Twin. Not Twin Turbo. See where I'm going with this? This truck had one front-facing cabin, but two engines again. One in the front, making 420 horsepower and propelling the rear wheels, and the engine in the back, making 340 horsepower, which did the same thing, but for the front. This thing was pretty much the definition of a monster truck. Making 760 horsepower, he decided to race with this truck. Sadly, he received a 15 hour penalty for carrying out prohibited repairs. With that penalty, he made second place. That was in 1985, I believe. Remember Group B? I thought that was insane, but this truck is even more crazy, reaching 200 km per hour and overtaking cars. In 1987, DAF won using the FAV 3600. You know why? Well, Jan had a bit of extra money in his pocket, it seems. So what does he do? He slaps two turbocharged 500 horsepower engines in his truck. This time, synchronizing both to an automatic gearbox. Crazy. And I'm saying that in a calm tone, because this just gets better. Jan's transport tycoon was doing well, so he stepped up. He made the final version of his truck, the DAF Turbo Twin X1. By now, the truck had a lighter cabin installed and several aerodynamic improvements, but also two 600 horsepower engines now with six turbines attached to them. These engines were connected to two automatic transmissions that were synchronized to operate under one lever. This 1200 horsepower truck was able to go 0 to 100 in 8.5 seconds and had a top speed of 220. Like no other, this truck managed to be faster than the Peugeot 405 T16, which we saw in part one of the car. I'm talking about bumper to bumper, these two raced to the finish. The DAF managed to beat it racing at 200 km per hour over the desert terrain. That is something special. The only reason why we never saw this thing again is because like Ruby Rally cars, it's simply too fast. One time, the truck hit a dune jump doing 200 km per hour. The truck lost control and rolled 6 times, seriously injuring the driver and mechanic, but killing the co-driver. That was too hard to face for Jan, so he and his team decided to retire the sport. This has got to be one of the most interesting stories in motorsport history. I should have saved the best for last, but we just gotta continue. After DAF quit, we saw Tatra take the podiums. In 1988, we saw Tatra, a Czech truck company, hit first place. They raced with their 4x4 815. The Tatra was pretty cool. It came with an air-cooled overhead valve, 12.7 liter V8 turbo diesel. This engine made 436 horsepower and 1500 pound-feet of torque. Impressive. Tatra got 2nd in 87, 1st and 3rd in 88, 3rd in 1990, 91, and 92, 1st in 94, 1st and 3rd in 95, 2nd and 3rd in 96, 1st and 3rd in 98, and 99. The list goes on, so I'm just gonna talk about the events before the year 2000. I have to tell you another funny thing. The first year the Tatra won, 1988, Ari Vatanen's Peugeot 405 T16 had been stolen in Bamako. This really made me laugh. I can't imagine people stealing rally cars in the middle of the season. The ransom for this car was posted at 25 million francs, equivalent to almost 30 million US dollars. And the car was eventually recovered, but they lost the season because of it. This episode is getting pretty long. I didn't expect to actually find this much information about these trucks, and I still have to mention 4 more manufacturers, so I'll be brief with some. The first one being MAN. They saw a lot of podiums over the years, the first one being in 1980 but they haven't made it to first place till 2007. So if I make a part 2 of this episode, I'll feature it in that one. The second is Hemo. I never heard of this one, but it's actually a Chinese truck manufacturer that managed to get second in 94 and 95, but then all three podium spots in 1997, and then second again in 98. I'm surprised, but sadly I wasn't able to find much about the setup they used. Let's get more descriptive again. 1990 marked the start of a new name on the leaderboard, that was Perlini, an Italian manufacturer. They raced with their 105F Red Tiger. The Italians always gotta have fancy names. 
Anyways, the truck featured a 600 horsepower engine, and this thing was in first place from 1990 to 1993, and took a few second and third places on the podiums. Impressive. Last but not least, we have the big Russian Kamaz. I'm actually gonna keep them for part 2, because after the year 2000 is when they really started to shine, and this episode is already long enough. So with that, I'll conclude part 1. Thanks for tuning in, stay safe out there, and I'll be back with weekly uploads.